This is Brian Schwartz at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm an infectious diseases doctor, uh, and I take care of patients with a wide array of infections. Uh, I'm going to continue discussing an overview of clinical infectious diseases, and I'm going to focus on treatment at this time. Learning objectives for this session are to recognize that antimicrobials can be effective treatments for many different types of infections. However, I also want you to recognize that antimicrobials alone are not always effective treatments for infection. Understand that antimicrobials are a limited resource and must be used judiciously. And lastly, know the difference between empiric and directed antimicrobial therapy. So let's start by thinking about the key principles of treating infections. Antimicrobials, as I mentioned in the objectives, are very important players in the management of infectious diseases in that they have the capacity to stop the replication of bacteria and other organisms um, and kill them. But they are not always alone able to cure infections. The three things that I want to focus on making sure you understand is that if a patient has an abscess, which is a large collection of infection, that these abscesses must be drained in most cases for an infection to be cured. And there are actually situations where antibiotics are not needed at all if you can effectively drain an abscess. For example, uh, patients who have small skin and tough, soft tissue infections with bacteria like Staph aureus can actually be cured when you just drain their abscess alone and don't need to give any antibiotics. Secondly, necrotic tissue must be debrided. So much like with an abscess, one of the reasons that you need to do things other than giving antibiotics is because antibiotics cannot get to the bacteria in the center of an abscess. They just can't penetrate and they cannot be effective at killing the bacteria. A similar phenomenon happens uh, in patients who have dead or necrotic tissue. That necrotic tissue does not have any blood supply and if bacteria or other organisms are living in dead tissue, if there's no blood supply, there's no antibiotics that are gonna get there via the blood supply. And therefore you need to debride or eliminate that tissue because it's not gonna be cured with antibiotics alone. Um, this is a case here, um, an image of a patient who has a diabetic foot ulcer um, and has uh, some dead tissue at the end of their toe. Um, other situations where we see this are patients who have another type of skin and soft tissue infection called necrotizing fasciitis that you'll likely hear about in other parts of your course. Lastly, another key feature to remember is obstructions need to be relieved. So if you give antibiotics for an infection that's behind an obstruction, you may be able to get some antibiotic penetration in there, but it's very difficult to eradicate an infection and you need to eliminate that obstruction. So in this image here where you see the red arrow, this is somebody's kidney that has a stone in it and it's obstructed. They um, have hydronephrosis of that kidney. Um, and your kidney infection will be very hard to cure unless you can take uh, away that obstruction. There are many other situations where we, we do this. Uh, patients who have obstruction of their biliary tree um, and have something uh, or may have uh, cholecystitis um, will also need removal of these stones to cure infections. All right, so now on to antimicrobials. Antimicrobials are super important to understand and you'll be learning a lot about them. Uh, the first time this really came to play was in 1928 when a lot of you guys probably are aware of Alexander Fleming who's discovered a substance produced by the mold penicillium that was able to inhibit growth of bacteria. Penicillin, very exciting, huge game changer in the way that we were able to treat and manage infections. It was interesting to recognize that, not, that bacteria and fungi um, have their own competition going on and inhibit and and that fungi actually are able and want to inhibit the growth of bacteria because they can be detrimental to them in certain situations. So let's talk about the great things about antimicrobials. So they have saved hundreds of millions of lives uh, since uh, they've started. Um, probably many of you have had the opportunity in your life to receive antibiotics, and although it may have not been life-saving, probably um, improved pain and suffering and duration of fever Antibiotics come in tons of different formulations. You can take it in intravenous formulation. You can take it in oral formulation. For some types of infections, there's topical antibiotic or antimicrobial treatments. Um, and they're effective 
when used in very short durations. A lot of um, our some infections only need three days of antibiotics. A young, otherwise healthy woman with a urinary tract infection could get three days of antibiotics in many cases. And in many cases, they're affordable. So these are just been absolutely revolutionary throughout the world and over time. And we are very fortunate to have science help us get there. So what's the not so good about antimicrobials? Well, we're competing against organisms that evolve much faster than we do. And because they have the capacity to evolve so much faster, resistance to these antimicrobials develops very quickly. Most bacteria have developed resistance to most antibiotics in some amount. Fortunately, it's not in large amounts in many cases, but in certain ones that you'll learn about, they are. Resistance is spreading worldwide. And why is this happening? Well, there are multiple reasons, but some of it is us as a group, as uh, healthcare providers, is that we don't always use antimicrobials in the most appropriate way. So sometimes inappropriate and excessive use by medical providers leads to resistance. Um, and then excessive use, particularly in areas like animal husbandry, um, there have been excessive use of antibiotic therapy. Some of the other things that have increased in uh, over the last couple of decades are infections like Clostridium difficile infection. This is actually a bacteria that um, is able to replicate and cause infection, predominantly in the colon, when antibiotics are used. This bacteria is able to replicate and produce toxin. And with the use of antibiotics, we've been seeing more and more of this. Look at a little bit more detail about the trends. Um, so you can see um, over the last uh, two or three decades, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, this is the uh, blue line here, um, has, was actually very infrequently resistant to an antibiotic called methicillin. We don't actually use methicillin anymore. We use something called nafcillin, but that still um, is how it's described in terms of resistance patterns. And you can see that resistance rates have gone over 50% for all Staphylococcus aureus isolates in the United States. Um, Pseudomonas is a gram-negative organism that can cause severe infections, often in patients in the hospital setting. And one of the antibiotics that um, really the only oral antibiotic that can be used for this, you can see resistance rates are arising. And then another bacteria, one called Enterococcus, that lives in the gut, has become resistant to a very powerful antibiotic caused, caused, uh, called vancomycin. And all of these have been increasing over time and continue to rise. Now, I wish the next slide showed you about the increasing number of new antimicrobials that are being developed and that this really wasn't an issue. But as you can see here on the y-axis, these are number of antimicrobial drugs with new drug application approvals. They have been decreasing over time. There have been multiple factors that lead to this. Some of these, as I mentioned before, that antibiotics are used for a short period of time. So in terms of an investment for a company, they may not be um, the kind of thing you want to invest in. So over time, we've been having new, fewer and fewer new antibiotics being produced. Um, but actually, recently, just in this year, there have been a couple of new ones that have come out. But we still have a ways to go. How do you, as a healthcare provider, prescribe antimicrobial therapy most effectively? Well, there are a couple of different ways to consider using antimicrobials. I think the way that we would probably use it most frequently is what we call empiric therapy. And I'll give you an example of this shortly. Um, is that when you use treatment directed against the most likely pathogens that cause a clinical syndrome. So you're giving antibiotics against the most likely bacteria that cause community-acquired pneumonia. So you know what those bacteria are, you think about um, what antibiotics might work, and you give that up front. The next is to think about is culture-directed therapy. And culture-directed therapy is when you know the, the bacteria, you know the um, antibiotic susceptibility pattern, and then you can pick one antibiotic that would be most effective. The last way that we use it sometimes is called prophylaxis or chemoprophylaxis. And this is when antimicrobial therapy is used to prevent infection in patients who are at high risk for infection. So that risk benefit actually weighs in the favor of, uh, of, of uh, using the prevention over the risk of long-term antibiotic use. Um, and most commonly, we see this in immunocompromised patients, patients who have HIV, AIDS, transplant patients, uh, et cetera. So how do you interpret antimicrobial susceptibility testing? So what uh, these tests do, they determine if bacteria can grow in varying different concentrations of antibiotics. And the term 
that you'll probably hear or you may have heard is MIC or minimum inhibitory concentration. And that's the minimum inhibitory concentration in antibiotic um, that will prevent the growth of bacteria. There are multiple ways that we test for it. So there's disk diffusion tests. Here you can see that this is a antibiotic uh, disk. And what happens is it seeps out onto this auger and bacteria have been streaked all over this plate. And so you can see that this bacteria on the plate is not able to get that close to the disc, implying that this bacteria is probably um, susceptible to that antibiotic and can be killed by it. This antibiotic that's in this disc, though, probably is not effective against treating the bacteria on this plate because you can see that the bacteria, um, kind of the opaque uh, white green, is able to grow right up to that disc. The, um, we also sometimes can use things called E-test. So this E-test is a strip that has an antibiotic gradient. Um, the gradient of antibiotic concentration is highest at this end. Um, and you can see that as more antibiotics seeps out here, um, the bacteria can't grow, but down low as the concentration gets lower, the bacteria is able to grow. Another way that we do it, and probably most commonly in the hospital setting, is something called broth microdilution, where we have multiple wells of, uh, with antibiotics that are increasing dilutions. Um, and you can see where the uh, bacteria um, is able to grow and we determine that's what the MIC is. That's the minimum inhibitory concentration um, to prevent growth of bacteria. So here the minimum inhibitory concentration to prevent growth is four because bacteria have grown in 0 0.13, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 1, and 2. But when you get up the antibiotic concentration to four micrograms per ml, that the, that the bacteria is unable to grow. There's no bacteria in here, and that's the minimum inhibitory concentration. Lower the minimum um, inhibitory concentration, uh, the better and usually the more effective the antibiotic is. You want to remember that when you're making decisions about picking an antibiotic, the minimum inhibitory concentration is not the only factor. You want to think about how high of a drug concentration can you get into the tissue. Certain antibiotics, for example, will get better penetrations into the cerebral spinal fluid and the urine. You want to think about getting effect. Um, you want to think about is that antibiotic harmful to the patient at high concentrations? So you might be able to give a ton of antibiotic and get above the minimum inhibitory concentration, but maybe at those levels, that drug causes seizure or kidney toxicity. And then sometimes you think about the concept of bacteriostatic versus bactericidal. That's whether the antibiotic is able to kill the bacteria or just prevent replication. If you have somebody who has a very poor immune system and their neutrophils are either absent or not functional, you'd want a bactericidal antibiotic that would kill because you don't have any help from your immune system. Also, there's certain sites of infection, like the cerebral spinal fluid, where you're not getting a very good immune response there, and you're going to want um, a bactericidal antibiotic. How do you determine which drug dose and route you're going to do? Well, you know that for the most part, you're able to get higher concentrations when you use intravenous or parenteral pre preparation, so you don't have to worry about going through the gut and then losing some percentage of the drug. Um, some drugs are only going to be available orally or intravenously. Um, you want to avoid interactions and side effects. So if you know that your antibiotic actually is a um, would change the level of another drug that the patient's on, that would be an issue. And then you want to um, remember that antimicrobials act on organisms in different ways. So for example, the beta-lactam antibiotics that's like penicillin, for example, you want to maximize the amount of time the drug concentration is above the minimum inhibitory concentration compared to aminoglycosides, where what you want to do is you want to get the highest peak concentration above the minimum inhibitory concentration. Let me give you an example. So for beta-lactam antibiotics, you essentially, you don't care how high that the um, peak is, but you want to make sure that you want the most amount of time that these humps are above this minimum inhibitory concentration. So in theory, you could imagine that an ideal um, concentration, you know, dosing would be almost a continuous infusion of drug where you're just above the minimum, minimum inhibitory concentration the whole time. This is in contrast to the aminoglycosides where it's really important to get very high levels um, and that is your goal here. And it, 
if you just had lower levels above the minimum inhibitory concentration, you would not be as effective, and actually you'd probably run into more toxicity issues with that antibiotic class. So let's finish off with an example of how you go from empiric to culture-directed therapy. So you have a 56-year-old man who presents with fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And you can see here on the chest x-ray, there's a big area of whiteness. This is a, what we call a consolidation, um, an area of opacity suggestive of pneumonia. You think the patient has community-acquired pneumonia, and you say to yourself, okay, what bacteria cause community-acquired pneumonia? Well, you know that streptococcus pneumoniae is an important one, mycoplasma pneumoniae is an important one, and there are several others. So you pick an empiric antibiotic regimen that you know will be infect effective against streptococcus pneumoniae, which would be ceftriaxone, and then you would pick, sometimes you need to use more than one antibiotic, and then you're going to pick an antibiotic that's active against mycoplasma pneumoniae, which is azithromycin. Okay, so that's how you've picked an empiric antibiotic regimen. So on the second day of your care of the patient, they're getting better. You picked a right empiric regimen, and actually the culture reveals streptococcus pneumoniae. So given that information, you know that you can start um, changing this antibiotic regimen. There's no reason at least you need the azithromycin. And then on day three, you actually get susceptibility testing, and you see that the penicillin MIC is low. You know it's susceptible, and you can actually change to a most more narrow-spectrum antibiotic like penicillin, which really is very specific against strep, um, doesn't cover a lot of gram negatives, etc. Um, and you can focus on using that antibiotic alone. So I hope that this has been helpful in trying to explain how we use empiric therapy and we move to culture-directed therapy. Um, Thank you for listening to this presentation.